Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for being here. I am um, something of a guest into Dr. Rusin's uh, regular briefing, um, and he will provide that regular briefing after some opening comments uh, from myself related to the education announcement. So I do want to, uh, though, start by thanking Dr. Rusin and all of those officials at Public Health who have been working very closely with the Department of Education and our staff led by our uh, very capable acting Deputy Minister Dana Rudy. It's been an, uh, a difficult but, um, but an important working exercise. I also want to especially thank the many stakeholders uh, who despite this being summer um, disrupted and put aside their usual summer plans to work closely uh, with us in developing a plan and a framework. Those would be uh, including but not limited to the Manitoba Teachers Society, the Manitoba Association of School Boards, the Manitoba Federation of Independent Schools, Manitoba Association of School Superintendents and the Manitoba Association of School Business Officials. Thank each of them and their, um, their workers for their support. We understand that at-home learning uh, that occurred for much of the past school year was difficult for many students, for many parents, and for many teachers. And we all know that school plays a vital role in the development and the future success of our young people. And that was challenged significantly with the suspension of in-class learning. Yet the reality is that there are also very real health considerations and concerns that come with being in a pandemic and the safety of students, the safety of staff has to be our top priority. The value of in-class learning and the need to ensure safety isn't an easy balance to strike, but much work has gone into trying to achieve that balance. About a month ago, we indicated that school divisions would be working on plans based on three scenarios. Those plans can now be refined and communicated to parents and students as we have with the approval of public health determined a path forward for this fall. So beginning in September, all students and all schools for all grades uh, will be back to in-class learning. Uh, it will resume for all students. For those in the K-8 to grade levels, this will mean full-time, five-day-a-week school. For high school, it is our goal to achieve uh, a five-day-a-week school schedule if those schools can arrange schedules in such a way is to ensure that the health protocols related to physical distancing and cohorting can be achieved. The best place for students is in the classroom and we are glad to be in a position to be able to bring back in the classrooms these students in September in this way. However, schools will not look like they did in the last September. There are a number of new steps that are being taken to ensure the health of students and staff and also to ensure that schools can be COVID ready should a case arise in a school. Many of these steps were successfully implemented in June when thousands of students returned to class during the successful reopening of schools for limited use in Manitoba. There will be increased emphasis on cleaning and hand washing and sanitizing all the things that Dr. Rusin has been busy reminding us of over the last many months. Both the schools and the buses will have additional cleaning protocols. On buses, students will have assigned seats and either sit alone with family or other students in their school cohort. Students will have greater space between them in class and many will be cohorted together in their learning group for the school day. Classrooms will be configured to achieve this. There will be a staggering of lunches and recess breaks to avoid congestion in common areas in the schools. Self-screening will be emphasized as will the overriding message that if you are sick, you need to stay home and you need to stay away from the school. And that equally applies to staff within the school and the students. 
while things may not be exactly as they were last September, the clear objectives is that we are able to return students to in-class learning while providing an environment that strives to protect the health of all those who are in the school. In spring of last year, we asked school divisions to accumulate their savings that they realized by schools not being opened. As a result of that and other adjustments, approximately $48 million was saved and is held by school divisions collectively. They can draw upon those savings for the additional costs that they may now incur. Of course, we as a government will continue to communicate with them on each step to assess their needs and how they can be responded to together. School divisions will now be able to communicate to parents with further specifics about their school openings. There will need to be an understanding that hundreds of schools that we have in the province do not all look the same. A high school with 50 students will face very different challenges than a high school with 1,500 students and local flexibility will be required as a result of those significant differences. I cannot emphasize enough how much adjustment and how much change there has been for parents, students, teachers and all those in the education system. And it would be wrong for me to suggest that the adjustment is over. It is not. There will continue to be challenges as we learn to live with the virus in an education environment. There will be situations that will require quick adaptation and if the situation changes in Manitoba and public health advice warrants, there may be changes in requirements in schools as well. But the last few months have shown us both the importance of in-class learning and how creative, resilient and determined Manitobans are. And we will undoubtedly need to rely on each of those qualities again in the months ahead. But we do welcome with our partners students back to school. It is critically important that they continue to learn, to develop and to prepare to be leaders of our province. And we really look forward to their return. Now I'm going to turn it over to my friend Dr. Rusin who is uh, going to provide some comments I believe on this matter and then also on his regular briefing. Okay. Thank you Minister. So the current uh, five day a test positivity rate is 0.4 percent. Uh, two new cases of COVID-19 have been identified as of 9.30 a.m. this morning. Uh, these two cases are in the Prairie Mountain Health region and are two men in their 30s. Uh, these uh, case investigations remain underway and further information will be provided if necessary. Uh, currently there are six hospitalizations, four of which are in intensive care. 76 active cases and 325 individuals have uh, been uh, listed as recovered. Uh, the number of deaths due to COVID-19 is currently at eight and I want to extend my condolences to the loved ones of our most recent death. An additional 1179 lab tests were completed on Wednesday bringing our total to 87,548. Uh, we are hearing that uh, people are frustrated uh, with the uh, testing and result wait, wait times. Uh, so at Cadham Provincial Lab, the on-site testing time remains uh, between 24 and 48 hours, uh, despite the dramatic increase in, in testing volumes. Um, we know that once samples are received at Cadham Provincial Lab, that uh, that time is uh, the test turnaround is 24 to 48 hours. But there's uh, delays in transport, and then there can be delays in entering the results into the system. So these are all things that we continue to work on, and and are trying to get our uh, those turnaround times uh, down over time. So we thank Manitobans for their patience. We are running a lot of tests. Uh, and again, positive tests are identified uh, quite early and reported out to, the, to those individuals. We know that uh, COVID-19 is going to be here in Manitoba for uh, months and, and maybe even years. And uh, so we need to continue to balance the risk of COVID-19 uh, with many things, including the need for students to get back to in-class learning. That's why our public health officials have been working with Manitoba Education to update these return to school plans for the fall. Um, this guidance uh, includes our fundamentals, the need for physical distancing, uh, hand hygiene, 
frequently enhanced cleaning, um, as well as uh, cohorts. And so this guidance will help reduce the risk while ensuring students can reap the many benefits of in-class learning. Uh, these actions are there to help Manitobans learn and stay safe. Uh, but certainly this is a change in, in mindset and behavior um, in continuation to much of the change we've all been going through. Uh, but it's, it's critical that we find ways to continue to live with this virus and balance it with the very important things such as kids getting back to school. Uh, so those uh, that are increased risk of contracting uh, COVID-19 and the severe outcomes need to continue to uh, take extra precaution uh, as others. Uh, ensure you're very cautious about entering indoor crowded spaces. We have a long weekend coming up. And so again, a reminder to Manitobans that this virus is still here. So we should all still adhere to the public health advice of physical distancing, watching those gathering sizes, avoid prolonged indoor close contact, uh, frequent hand hygiene, and again, very, very vital um, as we go back to school, as we go back to work, into the long weekend, uh, you know, as our path forward is stay home if you're ill, even if you're mildly ill. Do not uh, attend group events, do not attend school or work uh, if you're showing any signs of illness. Um, people who are have symptoms over the long weekend. Many of our testing sites are still open. So go to our website, COVID, uh, uh, or Manitoba slash COVID-19, uh, and take, uh, take a look at which sites are, are open on the weekend. And I still encourage Manitoba to stay home if you're ill, but do get tested. Uh, take this opportunity again to remind Manitobans to be kind to each other. A tough time for us all, and we've managed to get to this point by working together. Shame, stigma is not going to get us through this. So continue to work together as Manitobans um, because we're going to be dealing with this uh, virus for, uh, for quite some time. Um, back to testing for, uh, for a bit. We, uh, we know that testing volumes are up. We see that there are increasing uh, people with symptoms. We are seeing some more of the rhinovirus, the common colds, who are seeing people with symptoms. Uh, we have increasing cases which are um, uh, allowing more contacts to be tested. So. Um, I'd caution against employers to mandate testing in asymptomatic uh, employees. Uh, testing of asymptomatic individuals is not that useful, so uh, it puts an extra strain on our system to, uh, to mandate that. Uh, so again, the, the most important people to get tested are those who are uh, named as contacts of cases or those who have symptoms of, uh, of COVID. If you're asymptomatic, I encourage you to, uh, uh, to not get, uh, get tested unless it's advised. It just puts an extra strain on, on our uh, testing uh, numbers uh, for limited benefit. Uh, so again, uh, thanks to all Manitobans. Visit our website, manitoba.ca slash COVID-19 for up-to-date information. And uh, we can open up to some questions now. If a child or a staff member gets sick and comes down with something that has similar symptoms at school, there's obviously provisions in here to isolate them, have them picked up right away. Will they be required to have a COVID test before they can return? So we would be uh, strongly recommending that they be tested, uh, and public health would advise that uh, that strongly. Uh, if uh, if a person was not tested and had symptoms compatible with COVID-19, then they would have to be assumed to have COVID-19, so they would not be able to return uh, to school or work uh, for 10 days after symptom onset. And what is the limit as to when this needs to move back to scenario three, or we need to start scaling back? How many students? staff members, does that take to, or I know you don't like hitting a number like that, what is the, the scenario that we would have to be in to revert back to the end of school year? Yes, we're going to manage and, and follow a number of indicators with that, but all of this, um, all of these precautions are in place to limit the chances of um, uh, closures or widespread uh, um, um, uh, suspension of classes. So we have cohorts, so we limit the number of people who are being exposed. We have physical distancing to limit that. So, uh, so uh, you know, we're in a pandemic. We're required to our season, so we need to expect to, to see cases. Uh, and man uh, public health will follow, those, uh, follow up on those cases and their contacts and then advise uh, depending on the specific situations on, on who should be self-isolating um, or what ramifications that might have for, uh, for school. Mr. Dirksen, the, uh, the money uh, works out to my rough math on the spot here, about $60,000 per school on average. Do you think that's enough money if they need to hire more teachers, 
and assistance to get the class size down if they need to repurpose some of the physical spacing. And, and if it's not enough money, is your government willing to put up more? So, Steve, just before I answer your question, I wanted to, to comment uh, on uh, more along the lines of, of the nature of Brittany's uh, question. And you'll see that uh, education and health will be working closely over uh, the time of the school year. And so while, of course, we will be uh, together with the school divisions closely working on the operation of the education system as it relates to the different rules and, and things that are being put into place when there is uh, a case uh, that happens, and I think that Dr. Rusin is correct. We have to assume that there's going to be cases uh, that, are, that could happen in school because it happens in other places in society. Um, then we'll be working very carefully with public health, and they'll be sort of taking on those sort of questions about uh, testing and those sort of things. As I think the public would expect, right? The subject matter experts in health would then be stepping in and having that uh, advice. Now, Steve, to your, to your question. Um, the province, I think, wisely, when the schools closed down, uh, looked forward to this time when we hoped that we would be able to reopen schools and to welcome the majority, vast majority of students back. That might have at that time seemed optimistic because we were all going through a lot of uncertainty and we were watching things that were happening in other places in the world and didn't know where all of this was going to go. But I think that it seemed at uh, the time to be the right thing to do and it's proven that out. So there is a significant amount of money that exists within the school divisions. Uh, in the discussions that we've had with the stakeholders, and I started off my comments by noting that um, this plan is put together and agreed to by significant stakeholders like the Manitoba Teacher Society and the Manitoba Association of School Board and the Manitoba Federation of Independent Schools. Um, there have been discussions about what additional costs would be. Um, I don't think that uh, they can define at this point what all of those additional costs may be, but we have said that we'll continue to be there to, uh, to work as partners. I think that the, actually the collaboration that happened between the different organizations on this plan has, has really been uh, positive. And uh, I want to thank them in particular because sometimes uh, it's not easy to sign onto a plan sometimes. It's sometimes easier just to step back and say, well, let's see what happens. But they've been active. On average, and again, every school is different, but on average, <coughs> it's one teacher. Uh, well, but it's not. Uh, every teacher is not or every school isn't average so there's gonna be lots of differences in terms of schools right depending on physical space some schools might struggle more with the issue of of uh, equipment or hand sanitation sanitization others might have you know a pretty strong uh, roster of, um, of substitute teachers already that they have built into uh, their budget. We don't know what exactly the absentee rate is going to be either among students or among teachers. We do think it will be higher for sure and the planning has to happen around that but there's a lot of uncertainty. Well we do know for certain is that by taking prudent steps we do have money that's available now and by having that collaboration between the groups and the government we'll continue to have those discussions and I think we will in, in, uh, in fairly short order get a pretty uh, clear understanding of what we could anticipate to be challenges that might need more resources and things maybe that don't turn out to be the challenges that we might think sitting here, right? A lot of this uh, isn't, um, isn't predictable, um, but what is predictable and is certain is that we have a strong relationship with those partners. We've demonstrated it with this plan and it will continue. Ontario, uh, either gentleman, Ontario announced today, starting in the fall, students grades four to 12 will be required to wear a mask. Is there any thought of bringing in a similar policy here? So masks are, re are not uh, required or recommended uh, at this point on a mandatory basis. It doesn't mean that that students or, or staff, if they choose, uh, could uh, they could certainly wear a non-medical mask in um, in the school environment. But I uh, I take Dr. Rusin's words to heart uh, when he has often said that things change and the situation in Manitoba uh, can change. We always hope that it changes for the better when it comes to COVID-19, uh, but we don't know that. And so uh, that is not the current medical health advice. So this plan is based on what we know today. But as I mentioned in, in my comments, and it's a good question, that we need to be prepared for things to change and understand that the flexibility that 
parents, teachers and others have, have demonstrated over the last few months will need to be demonstrated again in the weeks and months uh, ahead. And that's not because um, that there is uh, uh, not a, a, a clear crystal ball. Uh, it's because it's a reality of dealing with a pandemic that it would be wrong for, for me to tell you that we know exactly how things are going to go in September or October. You can plan uh, and put a plan together that prepares for the, uh, the most likely things, that has all the partners involved, that has some of the best uh, minds when it comes to education and health involved in this, but none of them can guarantee what things are going to look like. So at this point, that is not the recommendation, but um, I think we'll continue to you know, inform uh, parents, teachers in the system if things change. Mr. Gerson, early on your government put aside, set aside hundreds of millions of dollars for equipment purchases, PPE to protect your most vital workers, your health care frontline workers. A lot of Manitobans say their children are their, their most vital resources. So I am confused. Why is there not like a contingency funding set aside to make sure that this school plan actually works? So we have, uh, and thanks for the, the question, Barley. We have had uh, discussions with uh, Central Services, Minister Reg Heller, whose department has been involved with the procurement of um, a PPE and, and feel comfortable in terms of where we are with the, uh, the level of, of PPE, and its PPE and its availability uh, to the province uh, at this point and they continue to look at, at sourcing for, for other um, uh, PPE that might become uh, more of a challenge uh, down the road. They've been very, very aggressive in trying to find uh, suppliers and you know the province used to deal with a pretty limited group of, of uh, known and trusted suppliers and they've been required as all provinces have had to do uh, to expand that significantly and they've done that successfully. So we feel comfortable in terms of where we are at this point in terms of, uh, in terms of that stockpile. Well, thank you for answering my preamble, but the question actually, forgive me for being wordy, is about contingency to make the school plan work. How, why is there no pile of money set aside for that, following along Stephen Rickett's question? Uh, because in our discussions with the, uh, the various organizations who are directly uh, running the schools, um, that has not at this point uh, been seen as the limiting factor. But we do believe that if it becomes a limiting uh, factor, we have the ability to resource um, those uh, pieces of equipment or other sort of um, requirements that we need for, for sanitization and, um, and they have signed off on the plan feeling comfortable with that. Budgeting is a big, big issue for parents. A lot say they simply can't drive their kids to school in the morning. They've relied on that. Um, we know that there's some stipulations in there where we can now have a few more kids on the bus. Are there going to be more buses? And, and what do you say to parents who don't have another option? So when we, when we met a month ago in this room on this similar topic, I think we left saying that the two hardest things to figure out would be busing and, um, and then the high school system because there are so many electives. Uh, virtually every class is an elective in, in the high school system and those would be the difficult uh, areas in particular. That it was a little bit easier with the K-8 and we'd have more certainty if we were able to bring uh, K-8 back. So uh, on the busing side, because uh, there has been good work done with public health and, and there's been a determination in terms of how we can essentially count those on the bus uh, as a cohort uh, group, we think that we'll be okay on, uh, on busing uh, when dealing with the school divisions that they believe um, that uh, those who need the bus uh, will be able to access uh, the bus and so we feel comfortable with that situation. We will still be asking parents though where they can uh, and where they're able and if they choose to, uh, to bring their student to um, their child to school. Um, but I don't think the situation is as challenging as we imagined it might be uh, a month ago. The high school situation still remains a significant challenge, but on the on the busing side, I think that that's um, I think we can give some comfort to to parents that if they simply can't bring their student to uh, their child to school, that um, they'll be able to have the bus service that they've come to rely upon. Because they've already made the decision for the fall, but you've got kids going to uh, in class K to 12 and universities uh, still online. Is there any direction? being given to universities about the fall or, or winter semester? 
So I, I, I as a K-12 uh, minister, don't give directions to the universities. We have an extremely capable minister, Minister Eichler, who is responsible for, for that file. Um, but I don't know that there's a direct, uh, that there's a direct impact on uh, how the K-12 system will operate uh, on to how the uh, post-secondary system will operate. But, Mr. 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 we have not talked about the headquarters. Uh, yeah, we, we, we provided uh, advice to, uh, to post-secondary institutions and will continue to do so. Uh, I think that there, you know, a lot of uh, that is more conducive to uh, virtual learning uh, as well, but uh, um, uh, public health has been, been involved and will continue to provide advice to them. Mr. 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 we haven't talked about class sizes yet. Um, will there be any changes? What what are class sizes going to look like this year? I hadn't talked about class sizes because they hadn't been asked, so thank you for, for asking the, uh, the question. Um, we're not limiting the, the size of classes. Um, what we are doing, though, is ensuring that the health advice that we've been provided is followed. And so the two-meter uh, distancing, of course, is the standard when it comes to physical distancing and where that can't be achieved and the cohorting of students um, that will still then require students to be seated a meter apart uh, would be in place. And so that's important for two reasons. One is that you get that, that distance still, even at one meter, you get that distance between uh, children. And if there is uh, a case, then the cohorting allows you to be able to do contact tracing quickly and to ensure uh, as best as possible that um, it doesn't um, affect those who are outside of the cohort and then potentially the larger school environment. And so um, there isn't a specific limit on class sizes, um, but there might be some limitations in that there are classes that are going to have to follow the um, the spacing guidelines, and that might you know, naturally itself result to some limitations, but there isn't a specific cap on that. Um, Mr. Gordon, we've but, heard a lot from a lot of uh, experts about the, uh, the the mental health aspect of first students and how the pandemic is, uh, is impacting them. What kind of supports is the province going to offer parents and students when it comes to the mental health impact when they're in schools? Are there going to be any extra supports at the schools, any extra resources at their availability? Yeah, and, and on, thanks for asking the question because, I mean, that's that's unknown and it's, un, it's an unknown, right? I mean, we know that there's going to be some uh, mental health impact on children, just like I think that there is in the broader society in dealing with the pandemic over the last number of months, but it's hard to define exactly what that will be. There are existing resources, of course, within the school system where we will ensure that teachers who are coming back a little bit earlier than students um, have an understanding of the resources that are available. I think that some of the uh, the instruction days that, uh, that they have, uh, they may be focused to some degree on on ensuring that they're recognizing some of the unique mental health uh, situations that might be arising because of children who are living through uh, this situation. Uh, there will be announcements coming uh, shortly on other resources that, uh, that will exist within the school system for teachers to be able to take um, a part on as well uh, to help their students. Uh, you know, we've announced previous uh, supports through the uh, True North Youth uh, Foundation. There's been some pilot projects in terms of uh, more wraparound supports in school divisions uh, that were announced in the last year. So there are um, there are significant supports that go into the school system when it comes to mental health. But I do think that there will be a need to to look at, if not enhancements uh, to those, then at least more specialized support because. Um, this is obviously something a little different and how uh, students react to it and the implications for them on their mental health might be different as well. Thank you, Minister. And we're going to go to the phone for a few calls now uh, from CBC Radio Canada, Mohammed. Hello, uh, Mr. Rochin and Dr. Mohammed from Radio Canada. Uh, I have a question about uh, how old schools who are who have old elementary schools at smaller safety uh, could handle uh, with the physical dispensation and is it uh, an option for, for for them to have remote school? So uh, thanks, Mohammed. I think you're cutting out a little bit uh, there. I, from what I, I took the question to be, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, re that for some uh, smaller schools it may be uh, easier to implement and there might be remote learning or remote school for others if it's not 
possible. Um, there's no question that when we have uh, remote learning, I think we're going to see more of that uh, in this uh, school year for a few different reasons. I mean, we're going to have, I think, a pretty high absentee rate uh, as a result of uh, students staying home if they are seen to be sick. Uh, teachers uh, are, of course, going to be uh, home as well, so we're going to probably see on both sides uh, more of an absentee rate. Uh, you may have students who are um, you know, immune compromised who shouldn't be in school and so they'll have to be and there will be specific distance learning plans put in place for them. Uh, and then if there are uh, situations that arise in schools that require there to be um, uh, some of those students at home for a period of time for distance learning, that will be in place. So there is, uh, there is going to be more reliance on, on distance learning, hopefully not to the degree that, that we had uh, last year. And that's always been the case somewhat in the school system, but I think that that will be, will be greater. And the department will be working with school divisions, of course, uh, to ensure that there are not only good plans in place, but good supports in place as well. We're a little tight on time today, so we'll just get one question from our telephone reporters. On to CTV Winnipeg, Jeff. Um, Minister Gerson, um, do you have an idea, numbers or percentage-wise, of how many high school students will have to uh, do some remote learning during the week? Yeah, th thanks, Jeff. I mean, no, I don't, because it's uh, now going to be uh, over to the uh, divisions to, to take the plans that they've been working on for the last month, the three different scenarios. Now they can go forward on a refined plan. Um, and, and a lot of that work ha has already happened. In fact, I would say the vast majority of that work has happened, and now they can just sort of refine the plans based on what they're hearing today. Um, for many, many high schools, I don't know that this will be an issue at all. They, uh, there are some that are smaller. There are some that have less... Uh, electives, there are some that might have uh, more space, and so, um, but there's, a, there's no question that, you know, we can identify some high schools like a Sisler and, or a uh, Steinbeck Regional Secondary School. I mean, these are very large schools, they're almost small cities at times, and uh, that is going to be more of a challenge for sure. So I know that they've already been working on uh, that challenge. We've, we've certainly said to them, our goal as a Department of Education, our desire is that all students are back five days a week. I think that would be the desire of parents as well, but uh, it has to work within the public health uh, guidelines. And so uh, I think that we'll be able to give you a more definitive uh, response uh, within a couple of weeks as they now refine their plans and then they put those plans out to their parents in the individual divisions and the specific schools uh, so that they can get that that more uh, granular uh, response in terms of um, how that will look for them. From City News, Jonas. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Minister Gerson, uh, apologies, I may have missed this earlier on the phone, but uh, post-secondary. Uh, what's the direction there? Are we getting anything coming soon or not? So thanks, uh, Jonas. Um, Post-secondary education is in the um, uh, department led by um, Minister uh, Eichler. Uh, and so I would have to defer the questions to, to Minister Eichler, although I know that many of the uh, post-secondary institutions, whether they're colleges or universities, have already announced uh, their plans and many of them are going to an online learning environment because, of course, their, their students uh, are different in the sense that they're probably more able uh, and, uh, and can do well in that uh, type of learning environment in many of those post-secondary classes. Uh, even when I was there, and that was some time ago, uh, were already uh, online. So um, uh, I think that they have largely announced their plans, but uh, this announcement uh, today from K-12 wouldn't uh, necessarily have a specific impact on their, um, their plans. From the Brandon Sun, Colin. Uh, hi, uh, my question is for uh, the Minister. Uh, the Brandon School Division has told me that they've uh, gotten a reprieve from their uh, required administrative cuts, and I know that that um, is where some of the savings uh, you're talking about for next year come from. Um, with them not having to make those cuts until next summer, will any other sort of assistance be available for the division here? 
So yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Um, you know, the department has been working closely with the different school divisions on the administrative part of the savings, which represents a relatively small part of the 48 million. Uh, it would, I think, globally represent about 15 percent. Uh, and of course, the the actual dollar figure would differ between division and division, depending on um, the size of the division and their overall budget. So, uh, it's a relatively small part of the. Uh, 48 uh, million dollars um, but it does speak to the point that clearly we've been working with uh, the different school divisions and their unique circumstances and many of them do have unique circumstances and equally we'll continue to work with them on COVID response as they have different uh, different needs and different circumstances they won't all be the same just as the schools are different the divisions are different and I suspect that we're going to find that uh, where some school divisions will uh, not have as much challenge on the human resource side. Others will have uh, more challenge than that. Some might not be as challenged in space and others will be more challenged. So we'll, we want to ensure that we get a sense of what their, their specific needs are. Uh, it makes more sense to, to, to work with them as we have been to say what is it that you are actually challenged with as opposed to just sort of uh, pulling a number out of the sky and saying here's a, here's a pool of money even though we don't know what it is exactly that you think you might be struggling with. So it makes more sense to be, uh, have that information from them and we've got a tremendous working relation with uh, relationship with them to get to this point and this plan which they've uh, had a huge impact in developing in which they've supported and we'll continue to work with them. Thank you Minister. We now return to room 68. I think Larry is here. <laughs> The eighth death due to COVID occurred on July 22nd, we're told, but it wasn't re revealed until six days later. Can you explain what happened here? Right, so, so again, passing on my uh, condolences to that uh, loved ones of that uh, individual. So uh, that was a, a gentleman in his 70s in Southern uh, Health who did uh, pass on, on the 22nd. Uh, public Health received the positive lab uh, result on the, on the 26th of, of July. Uh, and so we uh, we then announced it on the, on the following day after uh, an investigation. So, um, uh, and so like usual, public health will announce any details that is to the benefit of the health of Manitobans. But that's uh, that's all the details that we'll be releasing. Mr. Gertson talked a little bit about why there's no mask order. Um, can can you talk about why why students you know Ontario went to with a mandatory mask? Why why is that not happening here in Manitoba? Yeah, and so like the minister said, we. Um, it's not part of our plan right now, and certainly things change. And we're, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, as we move closer and closer to fall, masks are likely to become more and more uh, part of our plan. Um, as we develop this plan, they weren't uh, they weren't in in our uh, return to school plan at this point. Uh, but we're we're continuing to uh, review all these things, and and we'll continue to update as 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 needed. And what would trigger the requirement for a mask uh, to a mask mandate in public schools? Yeah, I think we're more of uh, the we're continuing to follow all the indicators that we have in our, um, our sort of our restart uh, plans. Um, you know, and just the amount of community-based transmission. Uh, we do look at other jurisdictions as well. So Ontario's plan, had, you know, has just uh, come out. So we're going to review that as well and, and look uh, elsewhere. So we'll uh, we haven't uh, closed the door on anything, but we'll continue to review. Often money is put in uh, for by parents, and supplies are bought and shared amongst some classrooms and students. So our parents going to need to be planning to, hey, you can't borrow my pencils, and they need extra supplies this year. Is this something that parents should be planning for right now? as an additional cost to, when it comes to books and, and whatnot. Yeah, they they should be, and and you're right. I'm sure that that uh, that sharing happens a lot, and so. Uh, there will be recommendations that that uh, sharing doesn't happen, that, that students who are bringing their, their lunches, of course, aren't sharing um, food. Uh, and I know from my own son's ex experience uh, that that happens. So I'll have to remind him as well um, that uh, no sharing of food, no sharing of the um, uh, pencils and the, and the other equipment that you are personally using. Uh, you should be keeping that uh, um, to yourself. Uh, lockers may be uh, restricted as well. So things will be a little bit more individualized for sure, uh, which can cause a little bit of an inconvenience, uh, I understand, and I don't want to minimize that. But I, I do thank you, Brittany, for raising the question because it is something that should be prepared for. Um, and uh, as we go along, there'll be certain things that 
uh, need to be reminded of because it'll be a little bit different than it was in uh, September, but still I think the most important thing is that kids are returning to in-class uh, learning, and I think that will give parents uh, a lot of uh, a lot of hope and optimism, and I think that they should have that. Doctor Dickson has to leave very soon. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes, yes. I, do. I didn't have a follow-up to my first question. Uh, Doctor Dickson, um, so the the person wasn't test was the the person who died was the tested post mortem. Then? Yeah, so I mean, these are the the, the type of details that will uh, we're not going to uh, you know discuss uh, for privacy. Person, though, to say that. Yeah, we, we, I mean, well, it doesn't uh, help Manitobans uh, with their risk uh, regarding COVID. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll disclose public health uh, information when it. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. So we do the exact same. Um, public health uh, investigation contacts uh, were investigated, notified. If the individual was in a place where we couldn't identify all the individuals, we would make an announcement to that. So that all those public health measures are in place. So since he was a known contact uh, or a contact of a person who had COVID before we were told, uh, then he, if there, there would have been suspicion that he may, uh, may have COVID. That's the, the typical uh, thing. So usually in, a, uh, in our public health investigations, we would do the contact tracing. We would attempt to uh, contact each of those contacts and, and advise them to watch their symptoms very closely. We'd usually offer testing as well. You're, um, you feel okay that all of the necessary investigations have been done? Yes. The contract tracing in a school, can you take us through the process exactly? A case is identified in a school, what happens now? Yeah, so if we identify a case uh, that's uh, in a school, then we'll look at the infectious period, whether that uh, child was in school during the infectious period. If so, then we'll start uh, obtaining all the information we need. Which cohorts were they involved in? Uh, investigating people who would, uh, uh, would have a good knowledge of whether physical distancing was, was in place, um, who they were in contact with during that school. Uh, we would then identify who uh, we determined to be close contacts, and, and those people would be required to self-isolate. Um, and uh, testing offered. So it really depends on, um, uh, on the nature of the exposures. Dr. Rusin, what specific triggers would move us from risk level two, where we are right now with schools, to risk level three or down to risk level one? So when we were uh, looking at this, we, we were going to really try as we move forward into the fall to uh, not do uh, to do more targeted uh, um, uh, risk assessments. So if we are looking at uh, if we start uh, seeing cases or transmission within a school, that's not going to lead us to uh, suspend classes in all schools. Um, and uh, likely not even lead us to suspend classes in that school uh, because we have things that are in place to uh, to contact trace. So um, it'll all depend on the, the nature of the transmission, uh, how many transmission events we've, we've seen in a school, whether it's all located within a certain cohort. Uh, so it really, uh, it's a tough question to uh, to nail down at a lot of variables. So I, you've said, and other officials have said that we're going to release specific targets for things that will change various aspects of reopening. We're going to tell you, we're going to tell you, when are we going to start seeing those? Yeah, yeah it's, it's in the works. I, I don't have a, a specific date on that. I don't want to um, uh, speak to a specific date that we, uh, we, we miss. Uh, so we're, we're working on it. We're going to try to have that out uh, soon. Anything else for the doctor? Yes, uh, one more if you do. Um, can you give us the transmission chains for the cases that were announced Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? We didn't get that. Oh, yes. Um, So on, uh, on Tuesday, uh, uh, two cases were uh, uh, close contacts with a known case and two travel acquired. Wednesday, two uh, were uh, contacts and one travel acquired. On Thursday was uh, one that would be classified as an unknown uh, acquisition uh, and one is still under investigation. Um, and so in total, four close contacts, three travel, one unknown uh, and one under investigation. Thank you for that. And how many, um, how many unknowns? I mean, we're always looking for that sign of, of the active cases or, or the recently deceased. How many are, are unknown and, and are we seeing any sign of community transition? Well, we measure that on a seven-day uh, rotation. So in the last seven days, we have three that we'd classify as non-epilinked. So, uh, um, you know, so uh, 
we have about 11% of our total cases are, are non-MPE linked. So we're not seeing a large amount of community-based transmission. Is that 11% uh, arise from previous rolling averages? Of the total, of all, the, all of oh, our total, total cases, yeah. We have three of the non-MPE linked in the last seven days. Dr. Sin, do you have, just for music class, for that, these are things we've talked about, do you have recommendations on whether those should take place this fall? Yeah, well, we have guidelines in place, so, the, you know, they're going to have to, you know, nothing is without uh, risk, right? So we're never going to get to a place with uh, zero risk. So we have guidelines in place on how um, uh, how these could be undertaken in a, in a safer way. Um, and so it's going to be really up to um, uh, institutions on whether they can, uh, they feel it could be appropriate for their situation. Thanks, Thank you. Um, when it comes to class sizes, we don't have a max. We do have that maximum for cohorts. Um, how many extra classrooms are we anticipating? We talked before about portables. I know that's not an option right now that you guys are looking at, but what about moving into the gymnasium or other areas? Has it been identified how many extra areas we're going to need? So within the individual, uh, thanks, Brittany. Within the in the individual school plans, they have done uh, a lot of that work, and so some of the schools for sure will be looking at utilizing um, the space, like gyms or other space that might. Be, have been used for different sorts of things within the school. So um, that work has been happening at the division and the school level. It'll be released when they release their specific plans to um, to the parents. Yeah, we expect that will happen within a couple of weeks. It could happen sooner for others because I think you know some are maybe a little bit more advanced. Uh, but I do expect that that'll be reutilization of space will happen for sure in some schools. I think that there's going to be some circumstances where we might need more, and some divisions might need more substitute teachers, right? So that there's a bit more of a flexibility. Um, if there are teachers, more teachers who are staying home sick, uh, or who aren't coming in for uh, a variety of different reasons that you could see uh, the need for more substitute teachers. Now, school divisions already uh, have a pretty uh, robust list of, of substitute teachers uh, that they can call. Um, and at various different flu seasons, which have been worse than others, and I remember that from my time as, as health minister, uh, you would have you know, relatively high absentee rates. I do expect that this is going to be higher right now with this potential commingling or uncertainty of what a person uh, might have when they've contacted something. So I do think that there'll be more use of substitute teachers, but it is difficult until we really get into it to define how much that's going to be. But there is a pretty strong list of substitute teachers that exist within Manitoba. Limited to specific schools so that they can't go from school to school, school or division to division? Will they be limited to one school or a number of schools? Yeah, so um, at this point, uh, that's not the recommendation that they'll have a specific uh, limitation. Uh, you know, we might see that come as we get a little bit closer and we get a sense of how much um, that is uh, that is happening, but of course they're following the guidelines, and they'd be following the guidelines within every school, and within every school division. Uh, do you know exactly how cohorting will be done in the high schools? Uh, you, yeah, you've talked about all the complications there, but do you have a picture of how that will be done, or will be that be up to each different school to figure that out? Yeah. So the the schools, and you're right to say that at the high school level, particularly the large high schools, it is the most difficult because. Virtually every class becomes an elective, and so you have significant moving around between uh, between the classes. And so there's been good work done in terms of scheduling. You may see less electives in some uh, areas. That's the reality, where you could have less uh, less electives that are going to be offered to make the cohorting uh, a little bit easier if they can't. Uh, achieve the physical distancing space um, and so each uh, each division will look a little bit different each school will look a little bit different um, but it may result in uh, some less uh, electives uh, and um, and potentially teachers moving around maybe more than uh, than students how big is a concern students coming back off of this big stretch back into regular class in terms of their education level and having them kept up with their studies to where they should be how much of a transition is going to be in place for that to get them back up to where they need to be. You know, it's, it's a concern. When we did the surveys with um, students, parents, and teachers after, uh, after classes were uh, suspended, it was a real mix, right? As you'd expect, there are some 
reports from students who felt they did better uh, for whatever reason at the at-home learning. There's many who didn't do well at all. Uh, and so, you know, in talking with the Manitoba Teachers Society, they feel comfortable and confident that they can use the, um, the time that's being allocated to help with that remedial, remedial learning. Of course, there are some days within the school year whether those are um, professional development days, for example, where we're asking them to be more focused on ensuring that they can uh, do work uh, to help on those who've had some uh, loss of learning and who need that remedial support. So there's a belief that uh, that time that is built within the school system will be uh, beneficial for that. But I don't want to minimize it and, and suggest that the loss of you know, three months or so of in-class learning uh, didn't have an impact. It did have an impact. It will have had a significant impact, not universally for every student. It'll be different for, for, um, for every student because they are all in different uh, environments and in different circumstances. But it'll be a challenge, but I think that there's a good plan uh, when it comes to remedial learning and uh, a feeling among uh, teachers that they can take on that, that difficult challenge. Is there any idea what's going to happen with school sports? Are those kiboshed for the upcoming seasons, or are they still in the works? So there, there are plans that exist when it comes to uh, all sports and the different uh, sports because they're not all as is, uh, risky when it comes to uh, virus uh, transmission. But I mean, the uh, gym, gyms and uh, sports can are able to continue so long as they're able to meet the guidelines that are posted and outlined and try to uh, maintain physical distancing. And again, you can imagine yourself that for some sports that's going to be a lot easier than others, but the guidelines are posted so there's not a specific prohibition against those sports, but for some it may not be practical and some of the divisions will take a look at that. Or if they go in secret, that's okay, right? Pardon me? If they go in secret from Saskatchewan, that's cool though, right? Uh, I, uh, I don't know about uh, secrets uh, in terms of what's uh, being done. Um, I. Um, I think that when I look at uh, the various um, players and stakeholders within the education system, there's a real desire to make this work. Nobody wants to get into a situation where we're having to close down schools or we're having to close down divisions or we have to close down the system. Um, and I've been very, very impressed with the different stakeholder organizations working with our uh, acting deputy minister, Dana Rudy, uh, to, to really come to the table and say, look, we, we know that there are things we may not agree on and there are things that we might uh, hope for in a plan that may not be in a plan, but ultimately we want students back in school. They all came with that goodwill. Uh, and I think they'll continue to demonstrate that goodwill as, as we go through this, recognizing that there'll be challenges here and there and some problems here and there, and we'll work together to get through them. The question about sports. I mean, there, there's somewhere, there's no physical distancing, obviously. So do, do you see any circumstance under which football, basketball, two of the big sports and I mean, there are guidelines that are already posted uh, on that, uh, Steve, and the different various leagues and organizations are trying to work through that themselves about how they can meet uh, those, uh, those requirements, and so they'll work on that with the guidelines that have been provided. How closely are you working with the families minister um, on plans for, you know, if, it, if a kid needs to stay home, um, what kind of help is there going to be for parents? Is there going to be any help, or is this just... Someone's got to stay home with the kid. Yeah, you know, we talked a bit about this uh, a month ago, right? And to say that, yes, absolutely, we have a tremendous minister of families who's, you know, doing great things when it comes to uh, the child care system and has, you know, had many challenges like every department has during this particular time. Uh, and that those resources, uh, you know, have been put in place as best we can in, in a challenge. But I don't want to minimize the fact that this is going to be different and that there are going to be times when your, uh, your child is demonstrating uh, a runny nose and maybe in the past, and I'll point to myself as being guilty of that, I'm a father too. I mean, there are probably times in my own son's life where I said, well, you know, it doesn't really seem that bad. I think he's okay to go to school and that has to be a different decision. Uh, now, um, and so that will place some inconvenience for certain on um, on families. And as we said a month ago, that's the kind of planning that needs to happen uh, already and needs to happen now. I don't want to suggest that 
everything is going to uh, to go without challenge or go without inconvenience. Uh, this is an inconvenient time for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, but I think that everybody's making best efforts uh, to do their best and provide supports. Thanks, a lot, folks. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the day.